Hello everyone, welcome back to The Request. It is I, Captain Logan, and joining me as always is The Day Ghost. Cap, I've got a request. Wait, no, I messed that up. I got a quest. It's <laughs> a request. <laughs> um, that's great, but it's not your turn. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a film that came out in 2013 called About Time. It's about time that we talked about About Time, and this comes from Gooster123. Thanks a lot for the request. This is a British movie that is uh, kind of quirky, off the beaten path, uh, kind of an independent thing. And Austin, I had no idea what this was walking into it. Um, all I got from Goofster was it's a time travel thing and a romance. And maybe he, he mentioned it was a comedy, I can't remember. But that was all I knew going in. And uh, I like to go into these things as blind as possible. Uh, and it was really fun not knowing what this was before I started watching it. Um, I will right away, I forgot to grab my sign, but I will right away say that I, I enjoyed this and found it interesting enough to watch it twice. Uh, I did look at it again oh, today cool. uh, because I wanted to show it to my wife because I thought it would be a fun thing for she and I to, to watch together. She also thoroughly enjoyed it and it's going to be a lot of fun talking to you about it, Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, why don't so well. <laughs> why don't you give us a little bit of a rundown if you can about, about uh, time. About time is about time in the sense that uh, you have General Hux, <laughs> who is the son of Davy Jones, and he learns that the men in their family uh, can travel through time. That's their power. And he should use it to make his life better. And so his idea is that he's going to use it for love. And initially he wants, or he has a crush on the new well, lead of the female reboot of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I wanted it to all be pirates, but there's only so many people. Would uh, you believe I watched this entire movie before it even occurred to me that that was Margot Robbie? Oh, really? She does look pretty young here. Yeah. So, yeah. Just didn't even occur to me. Is this your first Margot Robbie film outside of... Uh, Harley Quinn? No, but I can't remember what the other one was. I have seen at least one of the things she was in. Was it uh, Wolf of Wall Street? Yeah, I think that was it, now that you say that. And that was that was also by request. Because she has a really interesting filmography in that until the Suicide Squad, all of her DC projects are, like, embarrassingly bad. But she does, like, a lot of great stuff outside of that. Uh, like Wolf of Wall Street, um, that uh, Tanya Harding movie was really good. I've heard that. Yeah, it's really unfortunate. I think she's a great actress. Mm -hmm. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood's really good. And she's got like a movie star good. look. Like she's got like an old school movie star thing going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which works for uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Which I need to see. Uh, you definitely need to see that movie. <laughs> now, I honestly think that she's a great Harley Quinn if only she got the right material. But... Yeah, no, I like her a lot better in the Suicide Squad compared to the other two. Well, uh, she was, I, for me, the saving grace of Suicide Squad. Yeah, and I wasn't crazy about her in that movie. I thought her accent kind of went in and out, but... Uh, That's fair. Yeah, but she's definitely not the best part of uh, Birds of Prey. But now, at this point, we're just reviewing Harley Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. My whole, my whole name thing backfired. Because... She's great in this. She's, yeah, she, no, she's really good in this. And it's really funny because she's, and she's like, not even the main uh, like lead actress in this movie either. No, and uh, like on Amazon where I watch this, she's like third like build like when you look at like the cast, which I think is really funny and is probably only done now because she became somebody. Because <laughs> she's practically just bookending the piece, really. Not really bookending, yeah. but I mean, she so, she so, shows up twice and... She has a substantial uh, role, but not not even like a major supporting role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so this character, you know, first goes for her, and then learns the thing that we all have to learn, which is you can't make people love you, <laughs> yep. even with time travel powers. She's out of his league. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, uh, Harley Quinn would not get with General Hux. That's, <laughs> that is just like a thing. But apparently, uh, Christine Palmer from uh, Doctor Strange will. Yep. Uh, and also because I had the Pirates of the Caribbean thing, uh, he also lives with uh, uh, Commodore Cutler Beckett from the second and third Pirates of the Caribbean movies. That's really that's, funny. that's it for my name on uh, my name thing. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, but yeah, no, it's just it's kind of interesting as a rom com because it's less about like issues between this couple. Like he, they kind of get together, and there's not really a lot of like issue between them. The issues are more so other things in his life. Mm-hmm. Uh, like he's got some issues with his sister and then with his dad later on. There's definitely some conflict in this movie, but mm-hmm. it's uh, a lot more of a kind of like character piece, introspective thing. I, I, don't, I don't think slice of life is exactly the way to describe it because there is uh, certainly a story begin, beginning, middle to end, but I could see a person watching this the first time out and going, okay, when does like bad stuff start really happening to this guy once he finally, like, actually lands a relationship. Because initially, you know, the thing he wants as the protagonist is um, not not just a girlfriend, not just, you know, somebody to sleep around with, but the love of his life. That's what he's looking for. And he finds that fairly early in the film, and he uses his time travel ability in order to get there. And initially... Uh, I really thought that this was going to be a lot more of a Groundhog Day kind of thing, where I thought that he was going to have a lot of, there were going to be a lot of consequences to his using that ability, uh, like, like like negative consequences, um, you know, oh, you're taking the easy way out, uh, and you're pretending to be something you're not in order to uh, make someone like you. And that's not what it is at all. And I think that there are, you know, plenty of actual actions and consequences in this movie. Um, but I think the reason that he's kind of allowed to use that ability uh, is because his heart's in the right place, and he has plenty of opportunities to. Uh, not that he's a perfect person. One of the things I love about this movie is, that, and it's very, very British about this. One of the things I love about this movie is that you have a lot of really likable kind of a holes, like all the way through this, and uh, you have people who are kind of charmingly. Uh, sarcastic and mean to each other, and everybody seems very much on the same page about that in this family, uh, which I found really distinct and unique and kind of refreshing in that everybody doesn't get along and gets along great all at the same time. It's like a dysfunctional, functional kind of family. Um, Mm. But anyway, it seems to me like the whole movie is about um, learning that uh, you ultimately can't um like change um i'm not sure where i was going with this um well i do have to say uh, what you're thinking about that yeah uh, about your the like the british comedy thing uh this was written and directed by richard curtis who of course famously was like part of the kind of like duo with uh rowan atkinson that put together uh mr bean and uh black adder yeah so like he is a pretty big like uh person in british comedy for at least that yeah and it's a super clever script Mm Hmm. yeah and when i kind of looked up like you know who uh, made this before i started it the first thing i saw was love actually which is a movie my mom makes me watch every christmas i was shocked when you said that when you when you told me about that and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> it's a rom-com by that guy. Um, but then I was surprised because I ultimately uh, enjoyed this movie. <laughs> and it's not like Love Actually is very just here is every rom-com cliche. And this is not that at all. It's just it's like it doesn't even like feel like a rom-com in that way. Like I said earlier, like there's not a lot of like. You know, you don't get things like, okay, now the couple are going to break up. Like, are they actually going to get together in the end? I don't know. Yes. It's, <laughs> you know, not, that kind of... it's not gimmicky like that. It doesn't string you along. Uh, one thing that struck me about this is there are a number of scenes that give you kind of sitcom-esque situations, but handle it realistically. Oh, for sure, There's yeah. a lot uh... more like what would actually happen. With, with these kinds of scenarios. I'm reminded of the bit toward the end where uh, the, uh, this couple has children now and you, you have to sit through uh, a lengthy scene of um, Tim's wife trying on dresses 
And like this is a the sitcom situation, you know, you've seen a hundred thousand times where like she keeps uh, it's it's the it's the joke of the difference between men and women. And I uh, that that you know, the the rule is the man is supposed to just uh, kind of go along with whatever the girl is saying and feeling in the moment, because otherwise he's gonna get into trouble and look like he's not actually interested in her. And so uh, he just kind of becomes the yes man in that scene. Meanwhile, uh, his uh, kid is downstairs that he's not paying attention to uh, ripping up this extremely important manuscript uh, that she's supposed to take to this famous author that she's about to go have lunch with because her job is waiting for a publisher. And um, that whole scene, I was like, where exactly are we going with this? And I started feeling like we were maybe, we were maybe entering, the, I had this several times in the movie, too close to sitcom territory. And um, it it's still a surprisingly clever scene. Like there's there, there's there's some. Not only are there a, a couple of lines that made me chuckle, but you get to the end of that, and uh, she wends right back around to the initial dress that she started with, like you know, 15 minutes, uh, I, I, you know, before you finally get to the end of this conversation. And I'm like, that's exactly the lumpy dress that wasn't lumpy. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what this would be like. Like that's great. Uh, and then you, you get the consequence of that, which is which is the kid ripping up the manuscript, and uh, he could, you know, go in a closet and go back in time and fix it, but she won't let him leave the room, and uh, so so now part of the point of that scene is like uh, stuff that gets in the way of uh, of him being able to do this kind of limited uh, time travel thing um, that that he's able to do, and we're just we're really impressively uh, kind of weaving in that sort of sci-fi conceit into a movie that is not at all a, a, a sci-fi movie and not really um, about that so much as it's uh, about this relationship and uh, the importance of appreciating normality and uh, this is what I was trying to get to earlier, and the kind of mundanity of life. Like, uh, the, the end of this, we get this great line about, like, uh, exceptional, um, like, normal life. And uh, that was that was a whole thing that really resonated with me. Um, I'll say real quick, uh, and then I kind of want to get into the way the time travel conceit works, because I have... I like it, and I have issues with it, and and I, and I want to get into that a little bit. But um, yeah, for sure. I watched this movie twice, and I teared up in the same place both times. And it's always really impressive when a movie can do that to you, where I knew what was coming, and it still did it to me, and I didn't completely understand why. Uh, and it's... I don't know how spoilery we want to get because I don't know how many people have watched this and I and I want to uh, suggest that people look at it. Um, so I don't think I want to really give the ending away. But when you uh, get to the end of this, there is certainly you know a tragic thing that happens, and um, it's about uh, um, it, it it's about of course uh, time. getting yeah it, it is it is about time. Um, oh, if I can kind of suggest without. Uh, giving it away since you don't want to spoil. Sure, yeah. Is it the part where he he opens the door and it's you know seeing the person? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it, it, yeah. It's that whole thing. Uh, but I but I was just gonna say like like it's it's really a meditation on mortality and the importance of uh, like really appreciating and soaking in every moment that you get, which is uh, obviously a uh, lesson that you get in a million and one stories and it's an absolute cliche now but it made it so fresh again um, I will complain that in the internal monologue because there's a lot of voiceover in this movie it does maybe spell that out a little bit too much at the end where it's like yeah I can kind of tell that like that's what this is about you know is live life to the fullest treat every day like it's your last even though he's got this time travel thing he comes to appreciate um, each each moment as a precious thing to the point where he stops doing the time travel at all uh, toward the end and and I really like that so I mean that it hit home for me and it made all of that uh, like worth exploring again which I think is uh, maybe the best thing about the movie really is because you were talking about how it's not cliche there's a lot of like really obvious ideas that it's just repackaging in a way where it feels like I'm kind of seeing them for the first time 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, the last, like, half hour of this film, like, really hit me uh, yesterday when I watched it. And it was that exact part. That's why I was like, is it this part? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you uh, seem to act like that was hitting you in a real personal kind of place. Yeah, um... Because without getting into, like, spoiler stuff, um... Yeah, just kind of, like, personal stuff uh, with, like, family right now, especially. It was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess I will break out of my cynical, <laughs> a-hole-ish uh, shell here and say, good on you. Uh, was it Goofster, I think? Yeah. You said, suggested this? Yeah. For being the first person on request to make me more than tear up <laughs> oh wow <laughs> yeah no th this hit me like a bag of bricks <laughs> i got uh, halfway it was into rough. this and i was I like deposit <laughs> wow i was like i know that austin usually doesn't like uh you know real kind of mushy touchy feely kind of movies i don't know how he's gonna feel about this and when i got to the end i was like i don't know how anybody gets through this movie and doesn't feel something well and it's funny you say that <laughs> Because I actually had had that thought about, you know, is it the movie or is it just it's that specific like personal situation and that's the reason. And I'm I think it is a little bit of both because I do think this does handle it well. Uh, but that is definitely like I probably would have just teared up if it were just the movie. Sure, it, yeah. Like, you know. Yeah, well, and I, and I mean, I don't want to pry and get into personal stuff with you, but I... Well, that's but, fine. But yeah, just, I just don't want to spoil the movie. No, sure, but just but just for me, like, wherever I was, it, it, I'm, I'm imagining anyway, like, like in my life, in the way that that stuff might resonate with me. Because I think that... Let me say this real quick. I think that this movie is going to affect and touch people on different levels, depending on where they are in life right now. Um, because, like, you are probably responding to this as... A a, like, you know, son with, uh, with, with, a, with a father or some kind of, uh, you know, relatives. Um, I'm responding to this a lot more as a parent. Uh, and like, I, oh, sure. Yeah. I, and, and I mean, like, like the father son story, um, certainly, you know, moves me as well. And I really, I uh, you know, I tend to be a sucker for those. Um, but, I watched this very much as a nearly middle-aged man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, no, it's interesting. Uh, that kind of, like, different way of looking at it. But um, what I was going to say is, I don't... Sorry, I don't imagine no. that uh, if I wasn't invested in the characters, it would have... It, it, it possibly could have moved me the way it did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, no, I, I agree with that, definitely. Um, I think especially to the the whole uh, like walk part yeah. uh, near the end too, because that was the other thing was that it it kind of broke me, and then the movie kept going and I, I was fine, and then um, no, because it's around the same scene. There's something else around a bit after where like I was just like, oh no, is it happening gets, again? Then it gets you again, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I think the part where I actually had to pause it was during the walk scene. I was like, I need to take a minute. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah, definitely hit me in a personal place. Absolutely. So uh, I had to do another romantic uh, comedy slash drama uh, somewhat recently when I dealt with Before Sunrise, uh, before I started bringing you on to request. And that is, at this point, uh, my favorite romance film, absolutely. Uh, this is way close. Like, uh, definitely a close oh, second, cool. if not tied with it. Um, like, I... I, I related to it uh, just as much, I think, and in some of the same ways. And, and I have to say, uh, for better or worse, I liked this couple better. But uh, these are movies that are doing somewhat different things. Like, B Before Sunrise is uh, a, a much different animal that's about a couple that you're following uh, on their first meeting, and they may never see each other again by the end. Uh, this is... and. There are sequels, and those people, spoiler alert, will continue to 
that they have a relationship because there are sequels. But um, so so it, it becomes about more of some of the same things that are in this movie, certainly. But uh, this is much more about, for lack of a better way of putting it, kind of soulmates. What's up? Sorry, I, you keep going. Um, this is very much about, and every single time, <laughs> time. I watch time. <laughs> I, and it's very hard to hold that knee-jerk reaction. It's it's the only plausible title for the movie, right? Like it's a it's a double it, it's a it's a double if not triple entendre. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and you talked about the narration too, yeah. which, if I remember, don't that's like how they fit in the title, right? Or am I wrong about that? I don't remember. Does the title actually show up in the? I, I could be wrong because I also the narration part reminds me a lot of Love Actually. That's like the one thing I think is oh, kind of brought okay. from that movie, and they work the title into that. So I might just be thinking of that, uh, but it is kind of similar in that they both it bookends and it spells out the movie. Yeah, I uh, like I said I I didn't I didn't need it to go as far in the direction of telling me what the movie is ta- is is saying. Now I'm avoiding the word about, but um, but I did uh, appreciate that because it uh, it kind of establishes the quirky mood and just the language of the movie. I, I think you need that. I think this is a kid who has to spend enough time by himself, particularly early on, that we need to get in his head like that. And it's also just kind of a staple of this brand of British comedy. Uh, or or movies with British comedy in them. Like, uh, that reminded me a little bit of the first thing that comes to mind, I guess, is Stranger Than Fiction, something like that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's been a long time since I've seen that, but... That's great. Yeah, uh, definitely. So, let's talk a little bit about the time travel conceit, and I keep saying conceit, because in time travel very often uh, is a straight-up conceit. Here, even more so, because in a kind of Groundhog Day sort of way, we never know exactly uh, why this is even possible. It just is there. The difference between it is in something like Groundhog Day, uh, it, it shows up and then it leaves, where just at the beginning of the movie, you have a character who suddenly is going through a causality loop, and you never know why. It's like liar, liar. Uh, like, the kid makes a wish, and now the guy can't lie. Uh, there's there's no real, uh, you know, grander logic or mythology to it. It's just a conceit. This is, I guess, somewhere in between that and mythos, where you have a guy who learns that all the men in his family are able to do this time travel thing, and there is a set of rules... Um, but they're pretty arbitrary and kind of just there to facilitate the story, to make it... But, like, you can kind of see, and not in a bad way necessarily, but you can kind of see the author working their his way backward uh, a little bit. Um, I read just a tiny bit of background about this, and initially um, this came a lot more from just the idea of a person, like a coming-of-age sort of thing where a person kind of uh, comes to appreciate the uh, kind of, you know, simple things in life and the moment-to-moment and all of that. And he's like, well, it feels kind of generic. What's the what's the hook? What's the story? And then he, he inserts this time travel element. And so uh, you kind of have to, again, work your way backwards where it's like, okay, how exactly does the time travel work? And uh, since it's just there to make this story happen, uh, what's it going to do exactly? And so all the rules of it are just so that the story can unfold the way it unfolds. And the only real issues I have with it are that we're not given more of it early on. And I'm not saying that the movie's not playing fair with me, but... I was under certain assumptions that turn out to not be the case as I move along, and I, I, I think like nearly every problem I have story-wise with this movie can be fixed with a changing one scene, and that is the uh, exposition scene where the father on uh, Tim's 21st birthday explains to him that he can time travel and how the time travel works. This movie is terrified of too much exposition in that scene. And I need it. Uh, there, that scene needed to be two to three minutes longer. 
and it's uh, and, and so all the issues I have with the time travel could just be changed with that um, stuff like so this is what we're given right away. Let me break this down real quick. We're told that. Uh, the men in his family can travel uh, backwards in time in their own timeline, uh, sort of like Doctor Who. And uh, they can't go forward into the future. And the way that they can time travel is by getting into a uh, dark, enclosed space, like a closet or something. And it's, it's the most British thing I've ever heard. And, and, <laughs> and, and close your eyes uh, and uh, then uh, think about a time and a place in your actually not place I guess you're stuck wherever you're at um, but but think about a time in your life and then you wind up there right well there's stuff that he doesn't tell Tim that Tim takes as a given anyway and I don't know why and if the scene was somehow I uh, if, if somehow it was communicated to us pretty clearly that there was more of that scene and we just didn't see all of it, I would be more okay with it because you'd get the sense that the father told him some stuff that we just weren't privy to and that that scene is cut down so that we're just going to learn it as it goes along. Now, the, the writer side of my brain says, okay, that's the protagonist knowing stuff that we don't know and I don't love that, but at least I would understand why the kid knows stuff that we weren't told. That's not how it plays. It plays like the dad gives gives him th some information, but not everything he needs. So, I have questions, Austin. <laughs> um, how does he know the first time he travels back, when he goes back to the New Year's Eve party from the night before, uh, which is a wonderful scene, by the way, how does he know... Know that he can go back that to he the can present. go back to the present. I wondered that, too. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm not sure about that. How does he know that he could bring another person with him? Also wasn't sure, because it was very much like, oh, this is a thing he can do now? He, at at <laughs> one point, to try to make his sister happier because she is living with uh, a total horrible human being of a guy, uh, she he, he takes her back in time to try to make it to where they never meet. Um, I also felt like he easily could have tackled that all by himself and didn't need to bring her with him, but whatever. Um, and uh, he just knows that he can take somebody with him. That his dad didn't give him that. And then the third thing is, how does how does his dad not tell him about the uh, change in babies because of the sperm issue? How would especially, you not like, mention that? Especially like you know when she gets pregnant, you would think that if he was if he didn't mention that before because he was you know just like like an eight or twenty one year old kid. That's the whole thing, you know. I was told this when I was 21. I'm telling you this when you're 21. And no, no um, prospects. And the whole reason he wants to do this in the first place is just to try to get a girlfriend. Maybe mm -hmm. he wouldn't mention it there. Yeah. Yeah. So like, if maybe like if he didn't mention it there when he's just 21, like you would think at the very least when he finds out, like, oh, like my son's girlfriend's pregnant, like maybe then you would stop and go, oh, just so you know, <laughs> you know. Especially because if he is, first of all. His dad wouldn't know how often he's time traveling because it's it's not it's not possible to to always know that because when um, a person that is that is doing that time travels, um, you wouldn't know what things they were changing. Like you'd have no idea. Although there are some really nice like there's so much cool subtle stuff visually in this movie. There's a couple of places where um, the way Tim is talking in a scene, you'll get an insert shot with his dad where he's giving a look that says, I know this is not the first time around. And that's mm -hmm. pretty great. Yeah, well, and Bill Nye is too, killer Bill, in this. He's I was so good. Say, yeah. No, Bill Nye is wonderful in this movie. Um, and that and there's parts where, like, you know, they're playing table tennis and he yells, like, Davy Jones at him, which is <laughs> also awesome. <laughs> uh, but no, Bill Nye is great in this movie. And I think he's he must just be friends with this director because he's also in love, actually. So I wonder if, like, there may be... Interesting. You know, he does, like, a few of his stuff, yeah. Yeah, because he's, like, a uh, this, like, egotistical uh, singer in that movie. The, and he's, like, also pretty good. So there's this uh, added thing to the conceit because at first we're told that you don't have to worry about butterfly effect 
And I love that they just come right out and say that, because, you know, that's my big pet peeve with time travel. When we're not thinking at all about uh, what things you might inadvertently change going back in time. And here, they nip that in the bud right away. He just says, well, we haven't screwed up anything yet. We haven't blown up the world yet. Uh, here are the things you probably shouldn't use your time travel for because, not because it'll ruin anybody's lives, but because it won't make you happy. Uh, this is a movie that's all about happiness and time. And so... Uh, it certainly is. And, and so he says, you know, don't go back and just try to make a lot of money with it because uh, here's somebody in our family that did that. He's absolutely miserable. Um, I also love, by the way, that the time travel itself never makes anybody happy and actually kind of overly complicates people's lives. And his dad uh, it ended up kind of living a, by the end of the day, kind of a pointless life. He's not really doing anything. Um, where he's got all this knowledge and he's doing nothing with it. He does exactly what I would do. He uses his time travel to just go back and read his, every book he can read. Um, mm -hmm. Because the way, it, the, the way this works, if you've not seen this movie, is... Uh, you, it's not the Marty McFly thing. You don't end up with two of yourself back in time wherever you are. You land in your body in that moment, which means you are very nearly immortal, at least until, you know, you get to the point where you're going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, like, as long as you don't see the end of your own timeline, you could keep going back and just hanging out in the timeline for as long as you wanted, and you wouldn't age. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of yeah, cool. Exactly. I haven't seen that a lot. Yeah, no, theoretically, you could kind of live for, like, an eternity before you actually die, absolutely. Because none of them, the, the people, the couple of people that we see time travel in this, and I don't know if the eccentric crazy uncle does it. That was a big question I had. Well, I just assumed that it was, that he was, like, an uncle on the mom's side. Oh, uh, maybe and, he is. And I missed that. But he's super British. <laughs> yes, I have he is. Members like that. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, most of the time we don't go back all that far. This movie is super careful with the continuity of all of that, by the way. Um, we, can, we can talk about that maybe here in a little bit. Um, but the... Um, but let me get back to the whole added con to the conceit thing. So, uh, if you so so we're told initially that we don't have to worry about butterfly effect, and I'm like, okay, good. It's just a conceit. There's no actual time travel logic to this at all. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to find that it's uh, got an attention to detail, and there is in fact time travel logic in that it's really careful about uh, saying that things not only uh, can change even if it's mundane and not major stuff and won't blow up the universe or whatever, um, like in your own life, but also, and this is a thing I didn't catch until the second viewing, um, if you go back and change anything substantially enough, when you uh, will yourself back to your present, you will have new memories. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? That's really cool. Yeah, because that... Um... Yes, I did, because that's with the sister when uh, they get back and she's just like, oh, I'm with this person now. Yeah. That's weird. But it's, <laughs> but like but it's changed her. Like, she... Yeah. And there's maybe some, like, existential, you know, kind of kind of interesting, you know, you know, uh, moral questions and stuff with that. Uh, or, or not not moral, but just, but just like, uh, philosophical questions of, like, okay, are you the same person that you were before? Have you created multiples of yourself? You know, that, that whole thing. Um, because it nice it you don't know all like the this. decisions you made, so it's like the universe telling you that these are the... It's the Neo thing. Like, you've made this choice. You just you just didn't know you have to understand the choice, that whole thing. Yeah, and well, and it is nice, because as a comedy, it could have easily done the, like, oh, no, I'm in a future I don't have memories of, and I gotta, you know, be uh, careful to not let people realize that I don't remember things that we've done. And now it becomes a fish out of water in your own pool thing, where or your mm -hmm. own fish tank thing. That was a mixed metaphor, wasn't it? Where I put I put goldfish in my pool. When when you um, you want to go back in time and fix that? I do. I do very much. I, I've had I've actually had that thought a number of times during this review. Um, <laughs> but I uh, but yeah, I I really like that detail. I. Uh, 
because yeah, otherwise you'd it would be a different movie and you would be playing a lot of kind of obvious. You'd have to a lot of obvious comedy uh, mm-hmm. about how you know there would be people in your life that you've met that they know you but you don't know them. And all of that. It makes the whole thing a lot less messy. And it makes it a lot more understandable why these people would even use the time travel. Yeah, exactly. Because if you do that and you don't remember anything, like, that sounds like hell to me. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be worth it. You'd feel like you were living somebody's life over and over again. Mm-hmm. But there is uh, but there's this idea that comes, I think, too late. That um, the one major thing you have to be careful about is if you have children. Because, and this is a good idea, uh, whenever you uh, happen to conceive, uh, depending on what changes you make to your own timeline, uh, there, there would be a different sperm involved, which means you would have a completely different child. And so there's a moment where that happens, uh, where he tries to fix his uh, sister's issue, and then when he gets back, oh, now my girl has changed into the opposite gender. Oh no, and that's used as uh, a really great kind of roadblock and uh, kind of you know kryptonite to this power, where past a certain point, um, because you know he he wants to have the child that he's uh, that that he and his wife have and that they're attached to, of course. Um, you can't keep time traveling before that, which plays to wonderful effect and is part of the reason that you and I were tearing up at the end of the movie, certainly. Um, so, like, I like that a lot, but it needed to be there at the beginning, because until we get to that, when you said no butterfly effect, I thought you meant entirely. I thought you meant you couldn't change anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I assumed, like, there would there would be, like, butterfly effect, but not, uh, like, anything massive. Like, when he brings the sister back, I assumed, like, oh, he would come back, and maybe he's not married to the same person anymore. Yeah. Uh which we didn't do, but the kid thing I thought was still uh, pretty interesting with that. Um, and yeah, like an interesting detail that like a lot of people probably wouldn't think about. But it's odd uh, that they play it like it's the only major thing that, that, that you would ever change. That is true, yeah. No, that, that is definitely true. And I guess it's uh, not, because I mean, he, he intentionally is able to change like who his sister was is with and, you know, and stuff like that, but... Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you know, set her on a different path, so you get the butterfly effect of that, uh, but it doesn't really affect, like, him outside of, you know, just he conceived at a different time. Mm-hmm. But do you uh, agree which... that we should have known that earlier? Like, th- that... Mm-hmm. No, like I said, if if it wasn't in that initial uh, exposition scene... It should have at the very least happened when he got together with uh, Rachel McAdams' character. Especially, you know, they yeah. go to see the dad and they're like, oh, and by the way, uh, we're pregnant, too. It's it's an effective reveal, but that's the one thing in the movie that feels a little bit gimmicky to me. So that you can have that moment of, oh my god, the baby. I'm like, but, how, but he would have mentioned that. I don't know. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. That's... When you would think, too, that there would be like a moment where he's, you know, maybe his sister's dad, like, oh, do you go back to like your childhood or something and it's like no i can't because if i do you might not be born yeah that's a really good point Mm -hmm. yeah no that is definitely convenient and just there to set up that twist that was my biggest complaint really Mm -hmm. um there's some minor little uh conveniences or just like weird character motivation things here and there um this is weird i was watching this movie as much as a writer as anything and i kept imagining workshopping the script because it's brilliant but there is a slightly better draft to be to to be written like i i felt like um i i could like sit in a workshop and make a few suggestions uh, that might even make this piece a little bit better, or, or, or like, or like, you know, so, somebody like you get a bunch of people together, and like, here's a couple of things that aren't quite working. There's some tweaks to be made, is what I'm saying. Um, so, you've got, um, I, I love the complexity of the first meeting with uh, Tim and his future wife because he almost blows the entire thing by doing a really wonderful thing for the relative that he lives with who is a 
horrible but wonderfully charming human being. Like, he was one of my favorite characters because I thought I was going to hate him, and he's abhorrent through the whole movie, but he's great. He, he was like a British human version of Oscar the Grouch. Like, that was this guy. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I like that actor quite a bit, yeah. I didn't know him from anything, but he's this playwright. A lot of writers and readers in this movie. Um, like, like you, you can tell that this is written by a person in a writing world. And um, so, you know, it resonated with me on that level, too. But uh, you've got... Uh, this this playwright who's written this apparently great play, but the first night of it gets ruined because an actor can't remember his lines, which is really funny. And uh, and it's weird though because every time an actor who can't remember his lines says a line, <laughs> the audience applauds, and then the second time it happens. There's a standing ovation, like, in the middle of the scene, <laughs> after the exact line that they're supposed to have forgotten. That was very strange. <laughs> no, that is really funny, yeah. But what happens you is... you get a cameo from uh, Richard Grant. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. And it's the other guy uh, in that scene's uh, final film, too. Um, it's the guy who is... Uh, it's the guy he goes to first about the lines. He's the uncle from Harry Potter. Yes. Yeah, I I thought that's who that had to be, but I wasn't one hundred percent sure about it. Yeah, which is funny because there's a there's a line about Hagrid in this movie too. But anyway, so um, he, uh, he meets this girl in one of the most like uh romantic first scenes with a couple that I've ever seen. It's really well staged and really well written. Where they go into what my wife described as, and I hadn't even had this thought, a literal blind date. Where they go into this restaurant that, a really cool concept where all the waiters are blind and they take you into a basement that is completely pitch black and you can't see the people that you're eating with. So you uh, meet new people but can only hear their voices and interact with them physically and you don't see what they look like. So if you were to happen to hit it off with uh, somebody that you uh, might fall in love with or see yourself having a future with, you wouldn't uh, actually meet them face to face until you left at the end. But that was a really cool notion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a restaurant here um, that's like that except for you don't get sat with strangers. I would think the only reason you'd want to do it is getting sit, sat with strangers, or at least that, that's what that scene convinced I at least, me of. At least I don't think so. Maybe maybe that is, because I've never actually been there. But uh, a few people that I used to work with uh, went there. I couldn't tell, to be honest with you, if the concept was you're supposed to be sit, sat with strangers or if they were just so busy they had to. I, I couldn't tell. Wait, yeah, because you can't see anything. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Neat scene. But anyway, so the idea is uh, they hit it off. She gives him her phone number. You can immediately see what these people uh, have in common and why they would be attracted to each other. Um, they both are, in, are are really kind of like insecure, but cl but clever and kind of and kind of plucky and uh, weirdly proactive people. Um, like, it, but but in different ways. And then uh, he has to time travel. Um, in order to help his uh, his uncle, or I I forget uh, how I think they're it's related. Just a friend of his dad. Is that what I it is? Yeah, because that's the best part about it is that his dad is Davy Jones, and his best friend is the guy that controls Davy Jones. <laughs> I didn't even think about. It. I haven't seen those movies in so long. <laughs> they're my guilty pleasure series. <laughs> but anyway, so. Uh, he goes back in time uh, to fix his uh, roommate's uh, uh, play issue. And it doesn't occur to him that he is wiping over that first date and that her number won't be in his phone anymore. And I did have the, the thought of, I think that you would pick up on that a little bit earlier, where you'd be, like, like I would think that the conflict there would be, oh, God, do I go back or not? And he doesn't even think about it, which makes him a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. But I did sort yeah, of he wonder it. about it. No, for sure, because without hesitation, he goes back and helps uh, this guy out and, you know, 
fixes his career after this huge blunder that completely destroyed his play. <laughs> and, and, and this guy, by the way, who's not been super nice to him, and when uh, Tim gets up in the middle of the play to go help the second guy who forgets his lines, it's hilarious, and he has to show him all, all, all of his lines on a piece of cardboard. My wife was like, really, he doesn't remember any of the soliloquy? Like, <laughs> he... he I, he doesn't just get the first line of it and then and then remember the rest of it. He's got to have the entire. It made me wonder how many times Tim goes back in that scene. <laughs> well, and that was I think the funniest part of that whole thing to me is that uh, you know because he does it with the first guy who maybe has like two lines, like he has to say two sentences, but then it turns out that guy was fine anyways. And then it was the other actor who had maybe three sentences <laughs> to remember. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. Just in that, like, really? That's what you couldn't... I should understand why both of those guys were having such problems with that scene. (laughs) Um, But, so, so the idea is uh, he has now paved over the timeline so that he never met her, and he desperately has to figure out uh, uh, how to to get back to her. Um, So he meets her again... Uh, finally, because she has this obsession with Kate Moss, and he goes to a Kate Moss exhibit. And this is a, a place, uh, Austin, where I feel like um, it's the, the writing gets a tiny bit sloppy here and there. So he goes to this museum, and he meets her, and I like that he has no idea how to talk to her and uh, how to not come off, like, really creepy and weird. Um <laughs> What doesn't work is uh, after that when he learns... Well, first of all, he learns exactly where she is at a party because she has a boyfriend now, and he's got to uh, pave over the timeline so that she never gets this boyfriend. And he manages to get her best friend to tell him the exact play number of that apartment. I didn't bite that at all. No, I, I didn't either because it's like he, he's a weird creep. <laughs> and then he's, they're like, oh, we're at this party. What's the address? <laughs> tell me. <laughs> Every like, aspect of this. <laughs> okay. So that was a little easy. And then he, when, when he goes there and he meets her, he brings up un provoked whatsoever Kate Moss and that's the thing that makes her immediately go oh this is like my you know my my dream guy like my perfect guy and I'm like that would still seem a little stalkery to me no there there's definitely some moments with him where I'm like it's a little cringy like it's a little weird (laughs) this guy needs to learn how to talk so these are bits in in the story I feel like could be buffed out a little bit and then I this is kind of minor, but another thing that I found a little bit distracting was uh, his wife, when uh, this, this girl that he meets, um, has an American accent, and her whole family does. We meet her uh, parents a little bit later, and we're never told where exactly they're from, which I, I don't have a problem with. I guess they're, they're just Americans that live in Europe, but... What uh, was a little bit odd to me was some of the vernacular that she'll throw out, like uh, it's it's like she's British in the first place. Um, it didn't ring true to me. Like like maybe she's lived there a long time and would use yeah, some of the same words, say. but there there are places where I'm like I'm. It really seems like you just didn't give your characters enough of different voices or at least different vocabulary. There's just a couple of places where, um, and I'm trying to think of a good example. There were a couple of places where I was just like, I don't think she would say that. She hasn't talked like that this whole time, and then all of a sudden, um, you know, too much British vernacular is coming from her, I felt like. Yeah, you could have maybe done something interesting with that, like, uh, as time goes on, because it is about time, uh, sure. you get more of that from her because she's, you know, been living there longer and is like married to a British person. Sure. I'd like to know how long she was there when they met in the first place. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Because I don't think it would be that long, but we don't really get a sense of that. Uh, one of the most mature things this movie does is, uh, and, and you brought this up when we were talking about this in text earlier, uh, it doesn't go for the love triangle with Margot Robbie, and I really respect how that's handled. Yeah, when she comes back, I was like, oh no, we're going to do a whole thing now where he's going to go, like, 
back in time so that he was with her now and then he's going to realize that he actually wanted um, Rachel McAdams and then go back in time again and nope he just leaves <laughs> yeah I didn't think he would be able to control himself and you know not sleep with her because he he wanted that so bad earlier in the movie and she was that unattainable girl that is suddenly attainable um, I don't know if I buy that she's suddenly into him the, the way that, I, like, that script is trying. I feel like we needed a little bit more time with them in that dinner scene, maybe. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, probably just more time with that in general, because most of it, uh, most of that entire bit with her when she comes back is just, you know, being wiped away, being wiped away, being wiped away, because a lot of it is just going through the same moment. Yeah. So most of the screen time between them there doesn't actually happen from her perspective that really awkward meeting where he just cannot traverse the the whole girlfriend are you gay or aren't you thing which was like a part where i was like it's, uh, it's a little weird <laughs> i don't know maybe it's just like a a culture thing because i'm i don't know i'm just used to my mom she says that a lot well, what threw the wrench in it is that uh, Margot Robbie wasn't gay, but the girl she's with is, but they're not together. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. he just... But I love that, like, like whether you think that situation is funny or not, um, and, and, like, yeah, I didn't think it was laugh out loud hilarious or anything, but I did think it was really funny that his solution is just, okay, I'm not even going to meet her. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to change time to where I just don't even have to deal with this. And then she finds him, and, and then she goes, and this is my girlfriend. He's like, I'm still dealing with this. That's really funny. I like that his friend then goes, she's gay. Like, <laughs> yeah, that was up. great. And then I like how the women don't acknowledge <laughs> that he just said that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah totally there's so much great writing in, 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 in that movie. Um, but yeah, I was just using that as another example of um, bits where sometimes a character seems to uh, be magically doing just whatever the script needs them to, and I'm not totally buying motivation. Doesn't happen mm -hmm. a lot. It's usually not huge, but there's a couple of things like that. Yeah, exactly. It's that kind of, you know no movie is perfect type thing like there's obviously going to be issues and uh yeah there's just like some writing stuff here and there uh, i thought maybe the funniest line or one of the funniest lines certainly in the movie was uh that whole business with the playwright about uh the uh com comparing the uh performance of the play that doesn't work out to the titanic Oh, yeah. No, that's pretty good. Because he just keeps going on, and, and like, uh, he's so crushed and deflated, and it's hilarious, where he's, like, uh, it was... Th this uh, performance uh, was the sinking of the Titanic with no survivors, and, like, not even Kate Winslet survived. I mean, it, was, it, was, it just kept going. It was really funny. <laughs> I think uh, one of my favorite bits in it, and it was a joke that I assumed wouldn't be funny when they started it, and I don't even know if I can say it, but it's uh, when he meets the parents, yeah, and she's like, you know, don't bring this up, and then he, he's just, he brings up and then just goes, I'll just give me a second, and <laughs> walks away. It's these wonderful layered gags, right, where that scene is made even more funny by the fact that she makes the mistake first and then he does it. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? Yeah. Because yeah, no, because she, yeah. they're, they're like, okay, we're, we're not going to talk about, uh, the big thing was oral sex, like, we're not going to talk about that, <laughs> and we're, and I'll just say it, and, and, we're, and we're not going to talk about the fact that you live here, and immediately, because they're so nervous, because yeah. the parents don't know that he's going to be there, she opens the door, and the first thing she says is, uh, oh, don't be surprised, he's here, he lives here, and then he says the oral sex, it's really funny. Yeah, and he's like, but, but we're not having oral sex. I'll be right back. <laughs> What's that's <away>? great. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really funny. Um, and I, I love their banter through 
the entire movie. Uh, yeah, uh, the acting in general is really great, but those two, I, I agree. They're, they're kind of um, second. Their chemistry is really good. Their kind of second first date is so well written, where they both land on a stupid thing the other one said, and then they rip each other back and forth in like almost separate conversations. Uh, <laughs> that was some impressive writing. Like, that's the kind of stuff that makes me, like, jealous and irritated as a writer. Where I'm like, oh, I wish I had that in me. That's really good. <laughs> we need to read for a living. <laughs> we're, yeah, oh my god, it's so good. Where we're, he keeps going, like, uh, do, do you just get sick of, uh, like, reading to the point where you can't enjoy it anymore? Because it's, cause it's your job? And so, like, do you try to make people pay you for reading menus at restaurants? That's like saying I get paid to breathe. <laughs> it's really funny. And then I forget the thing she was going on about, but it was also really funny. Yeah, I'm, I'm blanking on it, too. Uh, yeah, there's something with him, too. Um, this is a really dense movie. There's a lot going on. I didn't mean to talk about this for a whole hour. Uh, yeah, we didn't even talk about spoilers. We still talked about it for like an hour. I mean, we... we Obviously, we've talked about some details and things, but I didn't want to give away the ending. Um, mm, no, for sure. And, um, what, what else do you want to make sure that we throw out? Because there's a lot here, and I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff we could talk about. Um, there's nothing that's hidden me. Anything you got? No, I probably rambled enough. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to thank Goofster uh, so much for having us watch this. Uh, this might be one of my new favorite movies. Uh, I, I, I really love this. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I complain about some things here and there because it's all, like, kind of kind of minutia and um, the kinds of things that jump at me because the story and the script is so otherwise, uh, you know, you know, brilliant and nigh perfect that I, I just... I don't know. I think it's sometimes more interesting to talk about things that aren't working and things that are, like, 98% working. And I come from a workshopping background, so I can't help but do that. No, uh, about time is about time, and for that, I give this film a 9. <laughs> <laughs> oh, real quick, um, before we wrap up, I think maybe we should address the question of uh, whether the uh the time travel thing is uh is too easy i mean like like makes his life too easy um because again the point at the end of the movie is that it doesn't and it can't make you happy but i mean is that a, is that enough because i know some people that saw this kind of complained that it was that it was like okay there's these guys in this family that can kind of just manipulate people and get and get whatever they want and he he like is able is able to get a woman to fall in love with him because he has this i don't think that's that's oversimplifying it i don't think that's it's exactly addressed. what's going like on it's addressed right at the beginning when he tries to do that with Margot Robbie and she's like no <laughs> both times <laughs> yeah no I do think that's an oversimplification and it's not really like they get together because they both like each other and they have chemistry not just because like obviously the time travel stuff helps with that and allows them to like fix uh, like screw ups but uh there is, like, some, like, personal stuff there to begin with. It's not just, like, oh, he found somebody and then kept messing with time until eventually they were in a relationship. Yeah, and you also gotta keep in mind that he nearly ruins the whole thing. Mm -hmm. When he meets her the second time. I also feel like this only works with a character who is, uh, like, as good-natured as he is. Like, it's really yeah. important that he saves the guy's play and that he doesn't sleep with Margot Robbie. Because mm -hmm. he, he, in my mind, kind of earns the do-overs because he's that way. For sure. And I think that also is gets really interesting with the sister thing. Because his very first reaction to that is, oh, I have to, like, fix her entire life. And, you know, he takes her back in time and changes it so that she was, you know, had a different path. It was completely different. And then... Once he realized, like, he wouldn't have the, like, have his kid anymore, it was like, okay, but that's going to come first. I will fix her in a different way. Yeah. <laughs> mm hmm Or maybe not fix. Maybe that's, like, not the right thing. But, like, help her get better. 
Yeah, and I mean, ultimately, there's still legwork she has to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, Just give her that boost that she needs to, like, make things right for herself. Well, and it's interesting that she still winds up with the same guy that she would have if they'd kept that initial time travel together, right? And mm -hmm. I kind of hadn't had that thought before, but, like, she still makes the choice to go after that guy. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just different time. Um, I think you could make the argument that it's a metaphor for, uh, like, natural advantages that people have in the same way that so many stories about people with superpowers are, right? Like, to say that, that well, life doesn't have do-overs, so it's uh, dumb to tell a story about a guy that can, like, you know, keep changing things um, so that things work out for him. Well, it's not any different than writing a story about somebody that can fly or turn invisible or mm -hmm. anything else, really. Because, especially because of kind of the moral of the story at the end, which is, like, we, we are all still the same. So, like, he has these advantages, but he's he's not special because of it. Yeah, I think it's that way that, like... Like, he isn't, a lot he isn't. Of... Mm -hmm. And I think in that way it's that kind of idea that... You know, like, a lot of good Marvel origins, for example, are re also really good, like, Twilight Zone stories. Yeah. It kind of fits into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I didn't even think of this as, like, a Twilight Zone kind of episode, but it could have been. Yeah. Maybe not as, like, happy, <laughs> but that would, the ending would be, oh, I have a different child now. <laughs> yeah, it would have stopped yeah, there, that, that, right? That, that, and like, oh no, yeah. and I and, and for some reason you can't fix it. Or it would have given you you know what Twilight Zone would have done? Twilight Zone would have mixed it with a genie story. You can time travel this many times. Or William Shatner goes back in time, he helps his sister, comes back and everybody is are pig people and then they eat him and that's the <laughs> end. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But I'm imagining, like, uh, oh, you can you can time travel exactly five times, and on the fifth time, the kid gets changed, and he can't he can't he can't fix it at the end. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Scary world that Twilight Zone. <laughs> Glad I don't live there. Well, anyway, thanks again for watching, guys. I uh, sure appreciate it. If you've seen this movie, leave a comment. Let us know what you think of it. Next time, uh, we're going to switch gears and do something totally different. Uh, we uh -oh, have... Okay, hold on. Let me... Drum roll, okay. <laughs> this is one of the first times... Actually, a lot of the times I don't know what we're doing next, but you've built this up to me, so I'm going to do a drum roll here. So we have a request from Jojira, who I uh, asked initially... I. Uh, us to do some manga, but I wasn't able to get my hands on any of the stuff that he requested. So um, I'm going to go for his other pick, which is, and I don't know how much of this we're doing yet, but he wanted us to watch some episodes of the old Ultraman series. And I'm pretty sure that that is on um, Shout Factory streaming service. I think. So I'm pretty sure we're going to have access to that and be able to do that. I don't know if we're going to yet, if we're going to watch those and talk about them, or if we're going to do a little mini marathon on them and uh, either blind commentary them or just regular commentary them. I haven't decided how we're going to handle that yet. Um, but we're going to watch some stuff that we've never seen and in a genre that uh, Austin especially has uh, very little familiarity with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have to figure that one out because I don't know if we have show factory streaming service but i'm sure i can figure it out okay and if not i mean i can just watch it myself and shoot a video and it'll be fine but I'll, i will just pretend that i watched them <laughs> <laughs> ultraman is about time <laughs> it's about time we we watched ultraman yeah it's ultra man <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, folks. We'll see you again next time. I was Captain Logan, and this was Austin. The day goes. I was also here. <laughs> Later, folks. <laughs>